should I keep admitting people or is somebody no, no, else no, going no, to no, do it? No, no, we'll do it. We'll do it. You don't have okay. to do it. Okay. okay. Uh, good morning and welcome to Pediatrics Grand Round. It's 7.30. This is our first Grand Round for uh, New Year. Happy New Year to all of you. Wish you happy, healthy and peaceful 2023 and years to come. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce this morning's Grand Round speaker, a good friend of mine for many, many years, Dr. Lalita Shivaswamy who is a child neurologist with special interest in pediatric stroke and headache disorders of childhood. She's a professor of pediatrics and neurology and vice chair of Department of Pediatrics at Central Michigan University and division chief of Child Neurology Children's Hospital, Michigan. She's a graduate of Madras Medical College in India. She worked as a primary care pediatrician for several years before taking up child neurology and headache training at Wayne State University. Dr. Sio Swami has taken interest, um, has keen interest in resident and student education and mentors several trainees towards their research and educational goals. She has authored several peer-reviewed publications in the field of pediatric stroke and pediatric headache medicine. In fact, recently, just today, uh, she and I uh, co-edited a book known as Symptom-Based uh, yeah, problems yeah. in pediatric neurology, which was just released today. So, um, uh, Dr. Shiva Swami, congratulations on your new book, and the uh, floor is yours. Wonderful. Good morning, uh, everybody. It's uh, lovely to be in uh, San Antonio. It's a lovely change from the dreary, dark day that I left in Michigan yesterday. And uh, thank you, Dr. Kamat, uh, for that uh, very gracious introduction. You're not on. on. Okay. So I have uh, no relevant uh, disclosures. I've obtained consent from parents for videos and pictures. So the objectives of my talk are uh, to use uh, certain interesting cases that I have personally encountered over the years uh, to review uh, the clinical presentation, uh, the etiology, uh, appropriate imaging, uh, treatment guidelines, and outcomes as well as differential of pediatric stroke. Um, so I would like to keep this talk uh, as uh, practical and, uh, you know, clinical uh, as possible, uh, which I uh, think uh, will uh, also generate hopefully some discussion at the end regarding your own personal experiences. And I would definitely like to hear your experiences regarding pediatric stroke uh, in uh, this facility. Um, so the term stroke itself is a very broad umbrella term. You know, there are different types of strokes. For example, this is an example of a hemorrhagic stroke. There's a large bleed in the right, uh, you know, uh, MCA territory uh, extending to the basal ganglia. Uh, this is an ischemic stroke. So it's a kind of a stroke involving a large MCA territory on the right. This is an example of a venous stroke. So there is a occlusion of the right um, transfer sinus. So that's a, also called a venous sinus thrombosis. So strokes can be of different types, but nonetheless, uh, for the sake of discussion today, I will just refer to, uh, you know, it as pediatric stroke. And when there are certain specifics, uh, then I will point it out. I have some videos in my uh, presentation and uh, as luck would have it, uh, the first video is refusing to open in San Antonio, though it did so in Detroit. Uh, so uh, I will just mimic what this baby is doing. So I have about six cases. So this is the first case. Uh, so case one was a six day old uh, little African American boy and he was admitted to our NICU. He was born full term, went home, everything was perfectly well. And then he came back in a few days uh, because the mother noted that the right arm and the right leg were jerking. Um, so at this point, if you can see me or, or, or if you can change your uh, uh, outline so that you can actually see me for a few seconds, I'm just going to mimic what the baby was doing. So he was jerking uh, the right arm and the right leg and then kind of jerking the right, uh, you know, uh, half of his face. So uh, it's interesting uh, that, first of all, it was a boy. Uh, secondly, his race is relevant. And thirdly, it involved the right side of his body. So these are three interesting features uh, in his particular case. Be on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, the first question is, what does stroke look like in young children? 
interestingly, uh, a stroke in a young child uh, can look very different than what we would think of as a stroke uh, in an older child. So, you know, our uh, understanding of stroke is largely derived from the adult literature. And even as, uh, you know, um, neurologists, pediatric neurologists, we learn most of our stroke, uh, you know, pathophysiology when we train on the adult side. And I think as, uh, you know, pediatricians also, you know, we are uh, kind of uh, influenced by uh, how we think about stroke during our training, in our medical school training. And also when we think of the word stroke, you know, the way it's depicted in the media and television and movies, you know, it all tends to veer more towards an adult stroke. But pediatric stroke can look very, very different. This is an old paper from the Curtin group, uh, but I think it's uh, interesting because it points out that the most common presenting manifestation of stroke in little children, especially babies, is actually seizures. And it doesn't even have to be focal seizures. It could just be generalized seizures as well. And I mentioned that this baby had jerking of the right arm and the right leg. And that's interesting because most neonatal strokes tend to involve the left hemisphere of the brain for some reason. So a term baby who is otherwise well, no HIE, goes home and maybe comes back in a few days with focal jerking is more likely to have a stroke than anything else. Another interesting uh, clinical manifestation of pediatric stroke is just alteration the level of consciousness. And, and that's really hard because any baby who's sick is going to be altered in their level of consciousness. I mean, that's such a non-specific symptom. Um, and uh, uh, another feature can be alteration in tone. And we would think that the tone would be reduced in the affected arm and leg. But interestingly, the tone can be reduced all over. I've had little babies who just present, you know, with total floppiness. They become like a rag doll for no apparent reason. And then we see a large stroke involving one hemisphere of the brain. So in other words, the younger the child, uh, the more nonspecific the symptoms are, which makes it very difficult for us as pediatricians uh, to recognize stroke in young children and babies. Now, the situation is a little bit different in adults. And at various points in the presentation, I will try to compare pediatric stroke to adult. Um, and in adults, oh, I mean, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, for example, that FAST is downstairs. one of the mnemonics we use in adults, you know, like face, arm, speech is time. So, you know, if somebody has facial weakness, arm weakness, they have difficulty talking, that's probably a stroke, you know, unless proven otherwise. Not so much for children. This is another baby who was relatively well until about a few months of age. And then the mother started noticing that there's certain preference for one side of the body compared to the other. But then she didn't think much of it. Uh, and then one day the baby started presenting with these spells. So these are obviously infantile spasms. Um, and as part of the workup, uh, we obtained an MRI and there was once again a large stroke affecting the right, uh, you know, MCA territory. And again, this is somewhat unique and interesting uh, to children because one would think that a stroke on the right side would predominantly cause symptoms on the left side. Uh, but this little fella was relatively well until he started having these infantile spasms, which are bilateral. Um, so once again, the manifestations of stroke need not be focal uh, in young children. So, but the older uh, a child gets, fortunately, the symptoms become a little bit more uh, localized uh, to the affected side. Uh, so we see more hemiparesis. Uh, we may see cranial nerve symptoms, uh, you know, so more like an adult stroke. There may be ataxia, but I would like to point out a red herring, and that is headache. So headache is, again, unusual in adult strokes unless you're having a big brain bleed. But in children, headache can be present in about 30 to 40% of ischemic strokes. 
not only in hemorrhagic strokes, but also in ischemic strokes. Uh, the reason for that is not completely clear, uh, but it has definitely led to a lot of um, missed strokes, and I've definitely had that experience personally. I've been burnt uh, by children who presented with a headache and some you know, mild neurological deficits. Um, and sometimes the presentation can be even uh, milder. Uh, this is a child, uh, she was about you know, maybe eight months old, and uh, she was just sitting and playing with her sibling, who was a toddler, and then the toddler kind of pushed her over. And then, you know, she just kind of fell onto the carpet, and then she became a little irritable, and she was crying, and uh, nobody thought much of it. Uh, but then after a few days, uh, you know, she became more and more irritable. Uh, just, you know, she came to the ER, and this is what she presented with. And she didn't have seizures, she didn't have anything. Uh, but as we can see, the right palpebral fissure is smaller than the left. And you may not be able to see, but there's also a smaller pupil on this side compared to this side. So this child presented with a new onset Horner syndrome uh, following a very, very mild fall. And we will come back to this little baby later to find out her final diagnosis. So recognition of stroke is hard, and um, you know uh, it, previous studies uh, done over ten years ago have shown that at major pediatric institutions, uh, the time to recognition of stroke from the time to onset of symptoms at that point, the study was done in about two thousand and eight, was close to twenty four hours. So as pediatricians, as pediatric ED doctors, you know, as pediatric neurologists, we were having a hard time recognizing that a baby was having a stroke. I think the situation becomes even harder when you're talking about what we call posterior circulation strokes. So the posterior circulation is, you know, this high value real estate over here, which supplies uh, the brain stem involving the vertebral and the basilar arteries. And these children uh, can present with very mild symptoms, which are extremely misleading. And I personally missed at least three to four posterior circulation strokes on the first go. And uh, oftentimes it's a young boy, uh, maybe a teenager, and, uh, you know, he presents with, uh, he wakes up with a headache and he's, you know, maybe a little uh, kind of discombobulated, a little confused, a little dysarthric, or he may come back from school acting a little confused. Uh, and oftentimes these children are thought to maybe have consumed some drugs. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time at the ER doing a drug screen, you know, questioning about conversion disorders, things like that. Uh, but in actuality, the child may be having a posterior circulation stroke. Fortunately, posterior circulation strokes in children don't carry the same mortality as they do on the adult side. On the adult side, they can have mortalities in the double digits, uh, and it is not so for children. The second case pertains to what causes stroke in children. So what causes stroke in adults is a little bit different than the etiological factors in children. So this was a uh, young uh, boy who, who was a very a good athlete. Um, he was uh, you know, kind of a healthy child, according to the mother. And uh, you know, he went to track one day, track practice. And uh, he was practicing really hard. And after that, after about a really strenuous uh, exercise, uh, he collapsed and uh, he had uh, weakness of, uh, you know, one side of his face and his arm. Um, and he was rushed immediately to the ER. And, um, you know, this was his MRA, uh, which is a uh, image of the blood vessels of his brain. And uh, later uh, that day, uh, he was uh, seen on the floor. And, uh, you know, this is an example of what we found on his skin. So he had these little brown spots all over. He had several of them, especially in his groin uh, and his armpits. Uh, he had these little nodules over here. And his MRA is, uh, you know, abnormal. And ideally, an MRA in a child this age should look like this. As you can see, the vessels should be nice and juicy and thick. Whereas in him, the vessels look really small. Uh, you know, he doesn't have many blood vessels here in the back of his brain. They appear to have died away. And instead, he has all these little, little teeny weeny blood vessels doing their best to keep the cerebral circulation up. But obviously, they failed. Uh, so this is a young boy who had Moya Moya disease. And uh, Moya Moya is an interesting uh, disorder because these children often have stroke when they're exerting themselves. 
Uh, I had a little baby uh, who had a stroke while she was crying really, really hard. Um, so sometimes hyperventilation uh, can precipitate a stroke uh, in these children. So what are the other factors that predispose to stroke in childhood? Well, are there any demographic factors? Age, yes. The younger the child, especially the neonatal age group, is a very high uh, incidence of stroke compared to older children. Um, so I would say about one in 5,000. If you're a neonate, more like one in 80 to 100,000 once you're an older child or teenager. Uh, interestingly, African-American children and Asian children, children of Asian descent, are at higher risk for stroke. And that uh, risk starts right from the neonatal period. So looking back at that little baby who was admitted at a few days of age, the fact that he was uh, an African-American little boy uh, should have alerted us to the fact that it could have been a stroke. Interestingly, Hispanic children have a lower risk of ischemic stroke compared to white children, though there is some evidence that they may have a little bit higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke, though, though the numbers are not completely clear. And interestingly, boys have a higher incidence of stroke throughout their life. Uh, well, the classic adult risk factors really don't pertain to children. So the classic adult factors are, of course, age and atherosclerosis. You can't really do much about either, to be honest. I mean, everybody's going to age. Uh, atherosclerosis, you can slow down. Uh, you may or may not be able to reverse it. Uh, but if you look at the stroke belt data put out by the CDC, this is the stroke belt in the United States. Uh, so it's kind of concentrated in this area. I'm from Michigan. We definitely have a higher uh, incidence of stroke uh, compared to the you know, the Great Plains over here, um, you know, there's a higher incidence uh, maybe in Florida, some of the other areas over here. Um, and this map interestingly overlaps with the map of hypertension in the United States, with diabetes in the United States, and with smoking. So those are the classic risk factors in adults. Uh, not so much for children. Uh, but another risk factor which may be common to both children and adults is abdominal obesity. So, you know, as we get older, all of us tend to pack on some pounds, especially around our waist. Uh, and uh, this abdominal fat is very pro-inflammatory. Uh, it predisposes to a pro-thrombotic state. And there is some evidence nowadays that children uh, who tend to have this abdominal obesity uh, grow into adults uh, who may have abdominal obesity and predispose them to, uh, you know, metabolic conditions and strokes. So that is something which I think as pediatricians, all of us, um, you know, should you know, be aware of and maybe uh, counsel families appropriately regarding diet, uh, regarding exercise. And of course, um, in our country, we have uh, an epidemic of uh, overweight and obesity with about 30 percent of all American children being considered overweight, uh, maybe about 15, 10 to 15 percent being considered obese, again, varying uh, by geography, uh, by race, and by socioeconomic status. Um, but uh, definitely, I think that is something uh, for us as pediatricians that we can influence and to, to potentially maybe reduce the incidence of stroke later in life. So what really leads to pediatric stroke if it's not the classic hypertension, diabetes, obesity? Well, this is a breakdown of... Uh, stroke factors uh, at our institution, and they may be similar in other areas of the country as well. Uh, and again, they may vary uh, depending uh, where you are in the world. Uh, for example, in uh, Asia and in Saudi Arabia, the causes of stroke tend to be a little bit uh, different. Um, but at uh, in Detroit, uh, my experience over the past maybe eight to 10 years uh, leads me to believe about half of all children who have a stroke have a hemorrhagic stroke. And again, that's very different uh, from the adult literature where, uh, you know, the incidence is lower. Um, and it's not clear why children uh, tend to have such a high incidence of hemorrhage uh, compared to ischemic strokes. Well, what about the rest who don't have a hemorrhagic stroke? Uh, about a third uh, potentially will have a cardiac etiology or an embolic stroke. And the most common setting in which this occurs is, of course, a congenital heart disease. And um, 
you know, it could be a, a variety of congenital heart diseases, transposition of great vessels. Uh, this was a little fella who presented to me with new onset ataxia. Uh, and he said, oh, I can't see anything anymore. And he was just like a two and a half or three year old. So we weren't really sure what he was talking about. But sure enough, he had a stroke in the occipital area of his brain. And that would explain why he had a visual field deficit. And when he said, I can't see anything anymore, he melt, I can't see one half of my world. And further investigations, of course, revealed a coarctation. So sometimes it's other way around. We first detect the stroke and then we go back and say, oh, there is a congenital heart disease, you know. And of course, sometimes it's the congenital heart disease which comes to light first, which would be the more classic way. Um, the other settings in which I see a lot of uh, stroke are uh, following cardiac transplant and uh, children who are on ECMO. Uh, they tend to have both ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes, uh, interestingly. Um, and uh, sometimes we think, well, the stroke is because, you know, the, cardi the heart is throwing emboli into the brain, but sometimes it's not because of that. Um, and it goes back to, uh, you know, embryology. The heart begins to develop about the same time as the brain vasculature. So when there are abnormalities in the development of the cardiac anatomy, there may be similar abnormalities in development of brain uh, vasculature as well. So sometimes they just happen to be coexisting conditions. Sometimes it's not a cause and effect phenomenon. Uh, infective endocarditis. Um, so, you know, those could be potential cardiac etiologies, cardiomyopathies. Um, dissection and arteriopathy is another big category. I would say about 20 percent. Um, or maybe less, maybe about 10 to 15 percent would be this category. And by dissection, uh, it could be a carotid dissection or it could be a dissection in the vertebral arteries. Um, arteriopathies uh, can be moya moya disease, for instance. Thrombophilia is pro-thrombotic states and a classic one is pregnancy. And uh, I can't tell you the number of times over the years I've been consulted on a uh, young teenager, a girl, uh, who presents with a new onset, uh, maybe headache, papilledema, and, uh, you know, um, imaging then shows bilateral venous sinus thrombosis, uh, or a young girl who presents with a new onset neurological deficit, uh, imaging shows a stroke, and then we would go back and do the workup. We say, oh, everything is normal, uh, but then, we, you know, we missed out on a pregnancy test. So pregnancy is definitely a pro-thrombotic state, and, and to me, that's, I think, worth mentioning. Uh, another pro-thrombotic state is leukemia. And nowadays with, uh, you know, better and better survival, survival uh, for uh, children who have childhood leukemia, um, I think that's important to know. Uh, this was a uh, eight-year-old uh, little boy who had um, leukemia and uh, he presented with new onset neurological deficits, I think ataxia, some headaches, some vomiting. So he had a initial imaging, which really didn't show much. So we were like, ah, oh, well, not completely sure anything's going on. Maybe it's meningitis, maybe it's encephalitis. We started thinking more infection. Um, but then the mistake was ours because we didn't do the appropriate imaging. And this was his MRI when we did do uh, special sequences. As you can see, there are innumerable hemorrhages uh, throughout his brain. Uh, so doing the right type of imaging uh, is also very important. Uh, but before we move away from etiology, I think this other slide, this other little slice over here, which says other, uh, that category is particularly interesting to us as pediatricians uh, because they're very unique to the pediatric age group. Uh, it could be metabolic disorders or it could be just uh, infections of the head and neck uh, or even uh, children in the ICU who have uh, sepsis, uh, lactic acidosis. Uh, children who have, uh, you know, a widespread uh, viral or bacterial infection uh, are at high risk for stroke. Uh, now, dissection is uh, relatively common in children, so I think it's just worth uh, talking about a little bit. Uh, and sometimes the factors that predispose to dissection can be very dicey. Um, if the pediatrician is in luck, we may have a good predisposing, you know, etiology. We may have a good story leading up to it. Uh, this was a 13-year-old little girl. Uh, she went to Cedar Point, which is a big uh, attraction, like a roller coaster type place. And then she went, she went on a lot of rides. Uh, she got off a ride and suddenly became aphasic. Uh, she couldn't talk. Uh, 
Uh, she couldn't understand a lot of what was being said to her. Uh, so the parents said, well, maybe she just had a long day. She's tired. But then later in the day, they said, ah, this doesn't sound right. Uh, so they took her to the local ER. She had a CAT scan of the head and it was negative. And the CAT scan was done within 20 minutes of the onset of symptoms. So that was a little strange, but they were from Michigan. So they came back home and then she came to the ER later that day and uh, through a series of investigations, we found that she had a dissection uh, of her carotid artery. And as you can see, it's occluded over here. And this is an axial view. And this is the dissection over here. It should look like this. This is what a nice, healthy vessel should look like. Um, and this was her imaging. So large stroke on that side. So this, uh, I think this case illustrates a couple of things. First of all, uh, you know, predisposing factors can be helpful when they're present. Uh, secondly, CAT scan of the head may be helpful, may not be. Um, and thirdly, uh, if CAT scan is negative, it may be worthwhile pursuing other investigations. And again, this is what a healthy, you know, vessel should look like, and this is what hers look like. So just showing that it was already partially occluded on that side, which would explain her aphasia because it's the left side of her brain. So dissection can be spontaneous, which is scary uh, because, you know, if there's no predisposing factor. I mean, why would you think of dissection? And this is where we go back uh, to this little girl, this, you know, who was sitting on the carpet and her sibling just gently tipped her over and then she fell down on the carpet. And then all the parents noticed this Horner syndrome a few days later, or maybe they didn't notice, they just brought her to the ER because she was irritable. And, you know, I think the ED physician actually noticed this. So this child had a dissection of the right carotid artery. So once again, dissection can present in a, in a very, very subtle manner. Uh, you know, the classic symptoms that we have, you know, pain at the side, bruit may or may not be present. Uh, and uh, this is an angiogram, uh, not this child's, but another child with dissection showing the very, very nice narrowing over here. And what we call the, the flame shaped vessel, like the flame of a, of a candle, the wick of a candle. So it's kind of occluded over here. Um, and, you know, after we, uh, you know, published a few of these uh, dissection reports related to roller coaster rides, uh, I got some interesting emails from, you know, the, the management companies of these roller coaster companies. So that, that made for interesting email exchange. Uh, other predisposing factors in, uh, in children can be, you know, collagen vascular disorders, such as Erlos-Danlos. Um, this is a kiddo who actually has hom homocysteinuria. Looks like Marfan syndrome, but it's not Marfan syndrome. It's homocystinuria, autosomal recessive. Um, children with Febreze disease are predisposed to pediatric strokes. Uh, we had a pediatrician in our area whose son has Febreze disease and who presented with recurrent strokes. And these boys often have lesions uh, which are uh, located in the scrotum. Uh, so looking, doing a general physical examination is very, very important when a child presents with stroke. This is a little baby who has a neurocutaneous syndrome called incontinentia pigmenti, uh, who also presented with strokes. Now, this is a teenager who has a very classic neurocutaneous syndrome, but went missed for many, many years because of the uh, of the tone of his skin. So when we think of, uh, you know, Sturge Weber syndrome, we often see pictures in medical textbooks of uh, children with lighter skin or, you know, a Caucasian children in where the port wine stain is very clearly visible. Uh, but in this young man, uh, you know, the port wine stain is present now that I pointed out, but, uh, you know, it really wasn't noticed until much later on in life, uh, but he has a, a very clear port wine stain on the left uh, side of his face, and he also presented with a stroke, which is unusual. Most Sturge Weber's children present way early in life with epilepsy and a lot of other things. Now, one uh, particular condition I want to point out is varicella-related strokes, so chicken pox. So children in the United States uh, are immunized for a chicken pox, but we do see a lot of children who come from all over the world, and I know you, uh, you do as well, uh, who are not immunized uh, for a variety of uh, disorders, for a variety of transmissible conditions. And uh, this was a young boy I saw from Iran uh, who uh, came uh, to Detroit 
with his family and he presented with a rash a few days after he came. And, uh, you know, we went to his pediatrician, diagnosed with chickenpox, all was well. Uh, but then about a month later, he presented uh, with weakness on one half of his body. And as we can see, his right posterior cerebral artery is completely gone and his imaging shows a nice stroke here in the right occipital area. So varicella-related strokes are unique and specific uh, to children. Uh, and the important uh, thing about it is that they can recur. So the chance of recurrence is twofold. So I think uh, that's important uh, to inform our families. And uh, the pathophysiology may be uh, retrograde transmission of the viral DNA particles uh, from the trigeminal ganglion to the blood vessels of the brain. And uh, this is what a normal blood vessel should look like in the brain. There's a nice, clear, you know, media and intima, whereas when you have uh, a VZD-related stroke, as you can see here, you know, the intima is completely torn up. Once again here, intima completely torn up. And this is what the thickness of the blood vessel should look like. And here, this infiltration with a variety of inflammatory cells, mostly T lymphocytes. So VZV-related strokes uh, can happen in children, usually about six weeks to about eight weeks out. Uh, but one thing I've learned over the years is that just because I find an etiology for a stroke, I should not hang my hat on it. And I found this out the hard way. Uh, this is not my patient. It's just a, a stock picture of a child with trisomy 21. Uh, I had a little kiddo with trisomy 21 who presented with a stroke. And I said, well, you know, it's a kid with Down syndrome, he probably has a cardiac defect, which he did. And uh, so we said, well, that's what it is. Um, but children with trisomy 21 also have a very high incidence of Moya Moya disease. Uh, and as you can see, he has complete occlusion of bilateral anterior cerebral arteries, bilateral middle cerebral arteries, and is barely surviving because of his posterior circulation. And uh, children who have uh, trisomy 21 are at risk for stroke uh, related to subluxation. So, you know, when we think of subluxation of the atlantoaxial joint, we think of paraparesis. Uh, we think of weakness of all four limbs, but they can also present with hemiparesis or stroke-like symptoms. So what this little fella taught me is that, you know, just because we find one etiology um, doesn't mean that we should stop looking for other etiologies. There can be more than one potential cause for a stroke in a given child. And oftentimes there is. And once again, that's fairly uh, unique to the pediatric age group. And as you can see, he's got strokes over here, over here, bilaterally. And uh, recently, uh, with the pandemic, we've had the opportunity uh, to look at uh, children who had uh, strokes related uh, to COVID-19. And uh, this is part of a uh, landmark paper that is published in JAMA Pediatrics. Uh, we contributed several patients uh, to this particular study, and uh, they found that children who have uh, the MISC type phenotype um, do have a higher incidence of not only coronary artery disease, uh, but uh, cerebrovascular events as well. We also noted that children who don't have MISC, so children who just had COVID, are also at higher risk of stroke compared to children who have not had COVID. And that risk seems to extend for a few months out. And so that's interesting in a sense, but again, it makes a lot of sense intuitively uh, because you know the viral particles and the viral DNA uh, can be transmitted through the olfactory bulb uh, to the cerebral blood vessels. A lot of children, a lot of adults do lose their sense of smell. They develop anosmia, uh, which means that there probably is some involvement of the olfactory tract. Uh, it could be a post-infectious response uh, like an inflammatory cytokine type response. Uh, it could be molecular mimicry. So there could be lots of different mechanisms uh, by which a, a child who has uh, COVID-19 can be predisposed to stroke. And I'm always asked about PFO. So I just thought I would mention that. Uh, I think PFO is one of those red herrings, which is often thrown in. Uh, so, you know, children who have migraine, you know, should their PFO be closed? Uh, children who have stroke, should their PFO be closed? So my inclination is um, 
to put it at the bottom of my list and to very aggressively pursue other potential predisposing factors. Uh, and uh, because a PFO is, first of all, very common, you know, in the general population, uh, about 25 to 30 percent. Um, and uh, so to say that the PFO is responsible for the stroke may not be accurate. And uh, recently there was a large study which looked at uh, PFOs in uh, strokes. And once again, you know, I, I, it, we cannot conclusively state that there is a cause and effect relationship. So there is very low quality evidence for closure. So as I said, my inclination is, you know, say, OK, the child is a PFO, uh, but unless there are extenuating circumstances, such as if the PFO is large, uh, if it's associated with atrial septal aneurysm, uh, if there are recurrent strokes, if there's absolutely no other etiology, that's when I refer them for potential discussion regarding closure. So case three. Case three was a 18 year old young lady. Her mother was a dentist at a uh, nearby very large academic center. Uh, and uh, she brought her daughter in uh, because she said, well, she was just, uh, you know, taking part in a like a uh, strenuous dance session. She was preparing for some type of dance program um, and she was a uh, very enthusiastic ballet dancer. And, uh, you know, at the, at the end of the ballet class, uh, she had, uh, you know, difficulty kind of you know, saying things properly and she had difficulty even um, mentioning what her friend's name was. And when the mother went, she said, you know, she asked her, what is this? And she couldn't say it was a watch. Uh, so the mom being a physician, she realized something was wrong. Uh, she brought her into our ER uh, within about maybe half an hour to 45 minutes. We did a CAT scan of her head and it was negative. So, uh, well, the CAT scan was negative and, you know, maybe we should have pursued further testing. Uh, and fortunately, we did, because actually with me that day, I had an adult neurology resident uh, who I think was much more attuned uh, to the symptoms of pediatric stroke, because by the time I saw the patient, you know, she actually started recovering. Uh, she was able to name things. She was able to understand things much better. She was responding to her mom well. Even her mom felt she was more or less back to baseline. She was willing to take her home and maybe just follow up in the clinic. So, you know, all of us were inclined to sending her home. Uh, but this other resident who I have to uh, credit, Jennifer Wee, uh, she said, nope, Dr. Swami, this just, just doesn't seem right. It was a transient neurological deficit and I, I think it's worth further, it's worth considering further investigations and it could be a stuttering stroke. Um, so, you know, I said, okay, well, maybe it is. I wasn't very convinced at that point, but of course an MRI shows a very large stroke involving the left hemisphere. Uh, and again, there is blood around uh, the left carotid. So once again, maybe the strenuous dance session, maybe hyperextending the neck, uh, maybe a particular pose that she adopted during the dance maybe predisposed her. Um, so I think getting an MRI was life-saving in this particular case, which brings us to the next question. What is the best imaging modality in children? So I think this case really brought uh, to light, at least for me, uh, that one uh, must not rely on a CAT scan. Uh, because when a child presents to the ER, I think that's the easiest test. I mean, all of us can access a CAT scan relatively quickly in our institutions. You know, it doesn't require, you know, any, uh, any sedation. It's right there, often right next to the ED suite. CAT scan is, you know, probably not the best test for a pediatric stroke. Uh, if it's a bleed, yeah, it's a good test. If it's a ischemic stroke, unless there's a big red arrow like here, may not be the best test. An MRI, on the other hand, is the gold standard. And uh, we often nowadays do what we call a rapid sequence MRI. So we just do DWI, which is diffusion weighted image, ADC, maybe a flare, depending on whether the kiddo can keep still. The DWI and the ADC together take anywhere from two to four minutes almost always less than five minutes. So many times no sedation is required. Uh, and, uh, you know, later on, if necessary, we can get an MRA, but this is what it would look on DWI. So nice, clear, bright, unequivocal evidence of a stroke makes life so much easier. Later on, as I said, we can get an MRA to look for more detail 
Uh, MRV can be helpful to look for venous sinus thrombosis. And I'm always asked about ultrasound, and I would always say, nope, even in neonates, an ultrasound is not the best test for a neonatal stroke. Do we need contrast? Nope, we don't need contrast. For CAT scan, we don't need contrast for an MRI of the brain. And again, never forget the neck. Uh, and once again, this is one of those things we tend to get a lot of imaging of the brain. We often forget that the vessels originate, that the arch go up the neck, and the pathology may very well be in the neck, uh, but we may not be looking at it. So I think we often had difficulty with obtaining MRI, and I'm sure it's similar in many institutions, uh, maybe even in yours, uh, because, you know, there's limited spots for an MRI, it requires sedation, there has to be an MRI tech, we need an anesthesiologist to help. So we said, you know what, we really need a protocol because the radiologists were having a hard time accommodating our requests. So we said, we really need a stroke protocol. Um, so we sat down and, you know, it was a multidisciplinary effort for hematologists, uh, neurologists, ED physicians, ICU physicians, radiologists, anesthesia, nursing. Um, and uh, we did some literature review. Uh, we created a protocol where one single phone call can fan out to about 16 different people. It's always attending to attending, uh, you know, so that there's, you know, we don't have to waste as much time. It's not that it's a waste to involve a trainee. It's always helpful for both. Uh, but then we just wanted to make sure that things progress quickly. So this is the stroke protocol that we came up with a few years ago. And uh, you may have a similar protocol here uh, where we have the risk factors over here. So the ED doctor doesn't have to think about, oh, is this child predisposed to a stroke? Most of the risk factors are just listed over here. Uh, there's a quick stroke screen over here. Uh, and then the ED physician, it tells the ED physician, hey, what about non-contrast CT? If it's hemorrhagic, contact neurosurgery. If it's negative, if it's ischemic, what should be done next? Then the radiology attending directly calls the neurology attending and then direct contact with MRI. So, you know, it tends to progress uh, in a much more methodical manner. Um, so if CT is negative, our protocol is to obtain what we call rapid sequence MRI, not the full MRI, but rapid sequence MRI. And if there's a stroke, then we decide if it's a cardioembolic or dissection type stroke, we either do heparin or aspirin, depending on the situation. If it's an ischemic stroke, we start aspirin. Uh, we admit the child to the PICU for the first 24 hours. We do an NIH stroke scale every hour for the first six hours and then every day thereafter. Something that has changed recently is uh, mechanical thrombectomy. And I think having the stroke protocol has allowed us to consider this new option for treatment. Because in the past, we weren't able to identify the strokes. And even when we identified them, we weren't able to image them appropriately in a timely manner. And even if we image them, you know, it was already well past the deadline where we could do anything. So I think doing having the stroke protocol has really helped us. Uh, this is just a screenshot of what the pediatric NIH stroke scale looks like. So if you're a resident or trainee uh, and, you know, you don't have the stroke scale in your head, you can just download it from the MD Calc website. I just have an app on my phone. So when I have a kid in the ER, I just open the app. It gives me the stroke scale and I just kind of go through it in real time and it adds it all up for you and lets you know what the stroke scale is. I think it's important for medical legal purposes as well. Once the child is admitted to the P, uh, to the PICU, these are the classic investigations that we do. And once again, pregnancy test should be included if it's a girl. I have not, but I think pregnancy test should definitely be there. So what has been our experience with the stroke protocol? Well, it's been helpful in some ways. It has helped to reduce time from C uh, to CT from the time the moment steps, uh, the child steps in the ER. We were able to reduce time to imaging uh, for CT by about 37%. But very impressively, at least in my opinion, the time to MRI was reduced by 80%. For us, that was a big win uh, because we were able to identify these children so much earlier. And this was especially important on weekends because weekends, you know, there's not an MRI tech just hanging around, uh, you know, so we were really able to reduce times on weekends as well. So uh, we felt that there were some positive outcomes to the stroke protocol. There was greater awareness amongst our uh, hospitalists and our, amongst the ED physicians, amongst the pediatric neurologists, amongst the residents and fellows. 
Uh, in fact, uh, the stroke uh, protocol was activated 18 times in the one year after we started the stroke protocol compared to, you know, the times we thought about it the year before. And currently we activate it about four or five times a month. Uh, that may be a little excessive, but we're going to get to that point. MRI is positive in about 40% of children when CT is negative. Again, that was a valuable learning experience for us. Uh, as I mentioned, it reduced the weekend effect, but this is not without its thorns. A um, lot of staff burnout, a lot of physician burnout because, you know, the neurology attending on call is contacted directly multiple times overnight. Uh, so, you know, the overuse of resources maybe to some extent because people are activating it much more uh, than maybe even warranted. Uh, so, yes, there are definitely some pitfalls uh, to this as well. The next case was a 12 year old fellow who was running track. He felt weak on the right arm. He went to his mom. She noticed a facial droop. CT was negative. He was transferred to a hospital. In the meantime, he developed a headache. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fellow on call called me and said, hey, headache, facial droop with a little bit of weakness. But mother has a history of migraine. I think this is hemiplegic migraine. So again, that headache, you know, that red herring in pediatric stroke, um, and the differential diagnosis shifted to migraine, rapid sequence MRI was delayed in this child, unfortunately. Well, what if we did identify the stroke early in this child? What if we did everything by the textbook? How could we have treated him? Well, the important uh, supportive measures for pediatric stroke are maintain oxygenation, make sure there's no hypoglycemia, um, blood pressure control to some extent, avoid hyperthermia, that's really, really important. It seems like such a small thing, but whenever there is hyperthermia, uh, the cerebral uh, glucose metabolism is increased significantly, oxygen intake is increased significantly. So just giving doses of Tylenol and Motrin, such a small thing can really reduce uh, hyperthermia and help with outcomes. Uh, but I think nowadays, I think our goal has shifted away from just supportive treatment to definitive treatment. Uh, thanks to the stroke protocol, thanks to the information that is out there now, I think we are more in a position as pediatricians to offer acute therapies that can really alter the outcomes for these children. So the acute therapies include clot lysis, such as IV intravenous or interarterial uh, TPA, uh, and more importantly, mechanical thrombectomy. I say more importantly, uh, because uh, it may be more feasible in the pediatric age group to do mechanical thrombectomy than TPA. Uh, the reason being that, first of all, uh, of course, there's no FDA approved TPA in the pediatric age group, but that's beside the point. We use a lot of non-FDA approved therapies in children. Um, there was a large study looking at uh, thrombolysis in children, and unfortunately, the study was just suspended because we could not recruit enough patients, we meaning, you know, the, the, the authors and the PIs of the study. Um, the average cost in the TPA group was significantly higher than in the non-intervention group, and the TPA group also had a higher rate of mechanical ventilation and mortality. So it's not, the, the study really was not a very resounding, uh, you know, uh, it didn't provide strong evidence that TPA can be particularly helpful in children. So at this point, there's no strong evidence and no clear-cut recommendations can be made regarding TPA in children. I personally still use it in children over the age of 16 in the appropriate setting, but I discuss it extensively with families and get their signature on a consent. Now, mechanical thrombectomy is where we at uh, Children's Hospital are leaning towards. Uh, this is a kiddo who presented with a stroke uh, at about, I think, uh, 2 a.m., uh, he was in the thrombectomy suite at about noon that day, so about 10 hours later, which I thought wasn't too bad. Uh, this was the clot that was retrieved from him. This is another child who had a longer clot retrieved. This is just a video of uh, the neurovascular surgeon uh, performing the procedure. It's a very quick video, so before I press play, I'm just going to show you the area of the clot. Here it is, right here. And you're going to be able to see his little catheter go up, snake around, and get to that spot. I'm just going to play it again, again, going up, getting to that spot. So we were able to fortunately uh, 
retrieve the, slot, the, the clot in that child. Again, not every child is a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy. There are specific situations where you need specific treatments. Uh, for example, you know, kids with sickle cell disease, of course, need exchange transfusions, maybe hydroxyurea. Post-cardiac kiddos may benefit from anticoagulation. I say may uh, because, again, it depends on the situation. Uh, and um, so, again, it's not one size fits all, but usually I at least give a dose of aspirin in the ER right away. I think that's the basic. Uh, almost nobody uh, is harmed by giving a single dose of aspirin. So I, at least I would do that while I discussed other options. Well, that little fellow who we delayed getting the imaging on and who I thought had hemiplegic migraine, of course, did not. Uh, he ended up having a very, very large stroke. Uh, my heart sank uh, when I saw it. Uh, and once again, you know, he, the child was admitted to the ICU. Uh, we ultimately had to do a hemicraniectomy. We had to have the surgeon remove, uh, you know, that part of his skull allow the brain to swell, you know, put in a little shunt. Uh, and unfortunately, he had very, very bad sequelae. On the other hand, if we were able to identify it early, he would have been a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy. So definitely a, a fail on my part. Now, finally, uh, this is a little guy who presented at about 4 a.m., a few days after we started the stroke protocol. So I was all gung-ho, very excited to see him. I landed up in the ER at about 4.30. And these were his symptoms. So, you know, I'm asking him, what's your name and date of birth? And he says, S -s -s September 25th, 2002. So I thought it was dysarthria. I think that was a reasonable uh, conclusion to reach on the basis of his symptoms. Uh, but no, he, he did not uh, have a stroke. Uh, he, in fact, had a conversion disorder. So what we found that after we initiated the stroke protocol is that only about 20% of children uh, who we are activating the stroke protocol for actually had a true stroke. Uh, and we published this uh, in pediatric neurology. Um, and as you can see, only about 20 to 25% had a true stroke and a significant number actually had functional neurological disorder or migraine or seizures or a tumor or multiple sclerosis or so many other things, uh, but not a true stroke. So this was a humbling experience. Uh, because it took a lot of time and effort and dedication and resources to put the stroke protocol into effect. Um, but it also taught us a good lesson that children are not just little adults. So functional neurological disorders are now uh, definitely in the differential when I see a child for a stroke. Uh, and again, there's no clear cut factors to say this is functional, this is a stroke. I've seen children with functional disorders who present very acutely. Uh, I see children with functional disorders who present with gait disorders, which look just like a true stroke. Uh, so again, just a high index of suspicion. Uh, finally, uh, what happens to these kiddos who have a pediatric stroke? This is uh, one of my last videos, and this is acting up. But let's look at this little girl. So this is my little friend uh, who had a stroke and uh, who obviously has hemiplegic cerebral palsy. And uh, children who have a stroke have very less mortality, but morbidity can be as high as 70%. Only a third of children have no deficits. Most of their deficits are psychological, learning, processing, cognitive. Uh, so in the past, we used to say, oh, your child had a stroke, but they're just going to grow and, you know, their brain plasticity will take over and they're going to be fine and not going to have any deficits because a child's brain has the ability and flexibility to do that. Yes, it does have this wonderful quality called plasticity, but it's not infallible. 
Uh, and definitely children who have stroke have deficits. And I think it's important to educate and inform our families about that. And to be honest and upfront about it, I think parents really value that. So the typical outcome is some type of deficit, usually learning. So the conclusions are that recognition of stroke in children can be very challenging because many children just present with seizures or just general symptoms. Um, varicella can be a predisposing factor. Cardiac factors are definitely up there, but a given child can have multiple predisposing factors. Um, reliance on CAT scan is probably uh, not a good idea. Rapid sequence MRIs are probably the way to go if possible and if uh, you know institutional support is present. Uh, Hyperacute therapies are once again uh, becoming you know mainstream. Um, either TBA or thrombectomy type therapies. And uh, my pediatric uh, you know, neurosurgeon tells me that he can do a mechanical thrombectomy in a child as young as three uh, because the catheters are small enough for a three-year-old. And uh, most children will have some deficits. I think one can say that uh, with some uh, clarity at this point. Uh, so thank you very much. Dr. Kamat has already warned me that I should stop very soon. So I appreciate your uh, uh, ability to attend today's talk, and I would love to uh, listen to your thoughts and uh, your experiences here in San Antonio. Thank you, Dr. Shiva Swami, for uh, education, educating us on acute pediatric stroke and their management and the complications. Uh, I already see a hand up. Can you please uh, uh, state your question? They may need unmute, to unmute themselves. Unmute yourself and ask your question, please. You can also put your question in the chat box. I'm, I'm monitoring the chat box. Well, I'll, this is Brian Fox. I'll take the opportunity from Child Neurology. Dr. Srivaswamy, thank you so much. It was a pleasure meeting you and your husband last evening, and thank you for coming to speak today. Um, now, I, I did have a question, and it, and it kind of goes back to um, the headache occurrence, and headaches are extraordinarily common in children, as you know, and it really uh, is difficult to discern the difference between those with headache and those with more concerning headaches. And you know, it, usually we want headache with something else uh, kind of piques our interest and acute headaches always worry me because as opposed to the well-established headaches. The thing that uh, my question is based on is more secondary prevention of stroke and the um, subsequent uh, studies that came out from Northwestern about um, those with recurrent headache after stroke also have me worried. And I, I was wondering, you know, since these headache folks we think may have um, uh, with stroke may have an arteriopathy. What kind of workup are you doing for these kids for secondary um, prevention or looking at them? Should they develop things like post-stroke um, headaches? Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, um, post-stroke headache is a bear, and I've definitely had some kiddos with that. And interestingly, uh, the biggest cohort I have of kids with post-stroke headaches are those who have Sturge Weber syndrome. Um, for some reason, one would think that that hemisphere is atrophied and gone and should not produce any pain, but it just causes this terrible uh, recurrent unilateral side locked headache. Um, and uh, in terms of investigations, if it's not Sturge Weber's, I almost always end up getting a conventional angiogram in these kiddos. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything underlying. Uh, and if the conventional angiogram and MRA, MRV are all normal, I personally have found Botox to be very helpful, especially when the headache is localized to one area. And uh, I, I mean, these children are usually already on aspirin, so potentially one could think that maybe they have a component of medication overuse headache. Um, but I've been struck by the number of times that the headache seems to be localized to that area, but the brain parenchyma itself has no pain fibers. Um, so, you know, it's it's very odd why they would have the symptoms in that area. Um, but yes, I have, I would say, about uh, three or four kiddos with Sturge Webers with very uh, um, intractable localized headache after stroke. And, uh, you know, I, I have personally found Botox to be very helpful in those kids. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you, Dr. Shosa. I mean, uh, there's a question in the ch chat box. Sorry, the boy with dysarthria, it was conversion. He was stuttering. 
Yes, that's my response, Dr. Kamath, because uh, somebody okay. had asked me um, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, what uh, we couldn't hear the boy who was wearing the green shirt. So basically he was saying, uh, you know, it is September 22nd. So, you know, that kind of scanning speech. So it fooled me and I thought it was a stroke. Uh, but I do see there are other que questions. Other than speed and convenience, uh, Dr. Hansen is asking, is there a reason CT is needed ah, before MRI in the protocol? Fabulous question, Dr. Hansen. I am so glad you asked this because I am with you 100%. I do not think that we need a CAT scan except, except maybe to identify children who have hemorrhage. I personally believe that one should directly go to rapid sequence MRI if that's available. So thank you so much. So nowadays, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, my ED colleagues often dissuade me and say, hey, Lolita, if we can get a quick CAT scan and know that there's hemorrhage and we can call neurosurgery, don't you think that's good? Yes, it is. Uh, but yes, I think rapid sequence MRI should very well be the first line. And a lot of stroke protocols nowadays are moving towards it. And I'm personally thinking of moving towards it as well. Dr. Meyer, what is the current recommendation for anticoagulation post-stroke besides aspirin? Okay, so again, it depends on the etiology. For dissection, in the past, one always thought that one should start heparin or warfarin. That's not true anymore. The American Heart Association guidelines uh, for pediatric stroke clearly state that aspirin is non-inferior to heparin. So it's equivalent. So I'm just doing aspirin nowadays for dissection. I do a dose of three to five milligrams per kilogram. The million dollar question is how long should one continue it? Three years, five years, lifelong. No one knows. I almost never like to say lifelong. So I say five years. Completely arbitrary. I don't have any evidence to support that. Um, so the duration, besides aspirin, uh, there is no evidence for other, uh, you know, like dual anticoagulants uh, in the pediatric age group. Uh, for cardiac kiddos, I mean, they almost always end up on heparin or warfarin, uh, in which case we use it for about three to six months. Uh, children who have venous sinus thrombosis, again, warfarin, I would say three to six months for those kids as well. Dr. Perlman, can anyone comment on whether rapid sequence MRI is available here? You may not know, um, either. I don't know either. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. So, Meyer, what about oral direct thrombin? Will helpful or extra? Thanks. Oh, you answered it. Okay. All right. Well, those are fabulous questions. Thank you so much. Any other I, questions or comments? For, yeah, Dr. Uh, Brian, Fox, yeah, question? yeah. So the, as far as rapid sequence, yeah, our stroke protocol has that as part of it and working with the adult neurologist, um, those sequences are obtained. Again, focusing on the T2, uh, flare, diffusion, ADC maps, et cetera. Good, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, I have a, a question. This is Nandini, um, and I'm sorry I'm driving. Um, I'm an outpatient pediatrician, and I'm thinking about um, evaluation for these children who do have a thrombotic event uh, for for further risk of other thrombotic events. Like, how many of them end up having some kind of underlying um, clotting disorder? Thank you, doctor. That's again a very relevant question, uh, and I didn't have time in this uh, you know short uh, presentation to actually address that. Um, I would say in my experience, about 30% of strokes who present to Children's Hospital in Detroit, I can't find an etiology. So there is something going on, obviously, but I don't know what it is. And despite extensive investigations, cardiac, angiogram, sometimes I do a panel of genetic tests, I do a whole thrombophilia workup, I still can't find out an etiology. And those are the children who you rightly mentioned are potentially at risk for other pro-thrombotic states because we never were <laughs> able to find out. Uh, but the good thing is um, children who have a stroke, uh, a brain stroke, as people tend to call it nowadays, uh, it seem to be at relatively low risk for strokes in other parts of the body. So they appear to be at low risk for coronary events or deep vein thrombosis, unless there's a clear-cut underlying predisposing factor, which is normally unearthed during investigations. But a child who's had a stroke uh, due to a brain vasculature problem, what we call an arteriopathy, is at about two and a half to threefold risk of a stroke, especially in the first six to 12 months. So I would say we can tell families that uh, strokes in other parts of the body are less likely. 
but in the next six to 12 months, your child may be at a higher risk for stroke. So we need to do A, B, C, D, E or avoid A, B, C, D, E, such as avoid birth control pills or avoid high dose estrogen. You know, make sure the child is well hydrated. If you're going on a long trip, make sure you walk every now and again on a plane. Um, but yes, thank you so much. That's an important point. Dr. Sivasamy, thank you very much for educating us on acute pediatric uh, stroke. We really enjoyed your presentation. I'm going to conclude this morning's uh, grand rounds. Thank you all for attending. Have a wonderful uh, Friday and wonderful weekend. Thank you all.